Hello. Welcome to the Deep and Durable Learning Podcast. This is the show for anyone who has struggled with the superficiality and short half-life of what passes for education. I'm Mike Gray, and I'm transitioning from nearly 45 years as a professor in higher education into this role of podcast host. Hundreds of my former students have told me that I taught them how to think. This show will offer my proven strategies that will enable you to make the most of your God-given potential to learn. I'll lead you through concrete steps that you, and your children if you're a parent, can take to make learning an exciting exploration of empowering ideas. Join me as we pursue deep and durable learning. This season, we've explored together how the human brain works and what that means for optimizing our learning. This season builds directly on Season 1, which dealt with what it means to know. Today, I plan to pull both seasons together. Join me as I put the seven C's of cognition into an integrated, actionable package. Knowing is always the result of sensory information. But our body's senses transmit an unremitting stream to the brain that would quickly overwhelm it. So, the brain filters the sensory torrent so that very little reaches the level of our awareness. This could be the death knell for learning, unless the student is curious about some aspect of the sensory information. Curiosity is, therefore, the fundamental prerequisite for learning. It's the big C of the seven C's of cognition. The quickest way to gain interest is through posing compelling questions. Compelling because we want to know the answers. I hope we've done that this season. We've had two overarching questions. One, what do we know about how the human brain learns? And two, how can we leverage these insights to make our learning deep and durable? When we talk about curiosity, some subject areas are immediately viewed with suspicion. But there are ways to make any subject interesting. G.K. Chesterton said, There are no uninteresting things, only uninterested people. Curiosity in the learner, the would-be learner, must be durable enough to propel the learner through the wrestling process that is essential to any lasting learning. It's true, uh, a teacher may have to help students see what is at stake with the question so that they care. The second of the seven C's is conceptualization. That is concept formation. And if the word concept is still a little foreign to you, that's idea formation, or even ideation in a very real sense. This is where I part company with many in the field of learning. Most educators and neuroscientists fail to make the crucial distinctions between information and knowledge. They speak of learning material an amorphous reference to whatever the teacher wants to talk about. This is so pervasive, it was reflected on by epistemologist Esther Meek in uh, her very small and uh, powerful book called A Little Manual for Knowing. On page two, she says, we, and she's referring there to uh, people in general with regard to 
what they think about how we learn and what we learn and what we know. She says, we tend to think knowledge is information, facts, bits of data, content, true statements. We conclude that gaining knowledge is collecting information. And we're done. Educated, trained, expert, certain. That's a pithy summary of what the educational establishment represents under the umbrella of learning material. The universe around us teems with patterns. And not coincidentally, the human brain is designed to detect and construct patterns. It is actually astonishing in this regard. As a database for information, however, it's quite limited. So what is a concept, an idea? It is a pattern perceived by the mind of a learner. Pattern construction begins at birth and possibly before. A tiny tyke's ability to express herself is because of patterns she has detected. These patterns of objects or behaviors are labeled with words that are the currency of communication and an indication of her thinking. Two-year-olds don't increase their vocabulary by memorizing lists of words, but their vocabulary grows explosively in their second and third years of life. They learn vocabulary by experiencing situations they enter because of their curiosity and in which they detect a pattern. That is, concept creation is the normal result of giving range to your curiosity. You are probably going to see some patterns and in the process create or refine some concepts. For this little tyke, their vocabulary represents reality. It is very concrete initially. Abstraction comes later, but by this same process of pattern detection and creation. There really is no other way to learn. Cognitive scientists universally acknowledge the process of concept formation through the encoding of patterns. But many articulate an epistemology that creates an alternative back channel. This channel serves to legitimate centuries of what are really obsolete traditions that do not respect the brain because they give a significant place to fact accumulation by means of memorization. Two psychologists, Henry Rediger and Mark McDaniel, in their 2014 book, Make It Stick, make exactly this mistake. On page 18, they say, quoting, Memorizing facts is like stocking a construction site with the supplies to put up a house. They call this fact-collecting knowledge, and they conclude their analogy with this. Mastery of house-building requires both the possession of ready knowledge and the conceptual understanding of how to use it. To which I say memorizing facts does not create knowledge. In the first season of this podcast, in episodes three and four, we dealt at length with what it means to know. The definition of knowledge, which is held for two millennia, is knowledge is justifiable belief. Fact collecting by memorization includes no justification. If they are true, the facts can be justified. The individuals whose conclusions the facts reflect did wrestle with ideas and could justify the facts. 
passive collection of facts by memorization fails to reckon with the conceptual process that produced the facts. Passive fact collection is not knowledge. And it is not durable because the brain isn't well suited to collecting facts over the long haul. So where does this leave us? I just summarize it this way. Never memorize anything that you could remember because you understand it. I don't downplay the role of facts in learning. Knowledge construction is accountable to facts. But when presented with a fact, back up and extract the concepts from the fact. Do you see the patterns? Do you understand how the concepts logically relate to create the conclusion embodied in the fact? Well, what's left to memorize? Not a great deal. Basically, things that are arbitrary without an underlying logic. The shapes of letters in the English alphabet, for instance. Why is an A shaped that way? The phonemes. Why is there a long A and a short A sound? The arbitrary nature of these things is actually what slows children down in becoming readers. Contrary to their acquisition of verbal language as verbalizers, when they read, children must do brute force memorization of 26 letters and 44 phonemes so that they know how to decode what they are reading. Because they use these 26 letters and 44 phonemes nearly every day of their life after becoming readers, they eventually remember them. But this is exceptional and not normative. The chemical symbols Na for sodium, Au for gold, etc. are likewise arbitrary and must be memorized. However, the periodic table in contrast, is all about patterns within the elements and is intensely logical and pattern-ridden, hence the term periodic, which shows these patterns. Multiplication tables are often memorized, but a better way to master them is to leverage our strong native ability to see patterns. While we're on patterns, let me point out the third C, which is connectivity. Concepts need to become intricately linked to a multitude of other concepts to develop the necessary cognitive nuance. This web of concepts is not just associational, however. If two concepts are linked, learners need to understand the nature of their relationship. The two big types of relationship are hierarchical and causative. In hierarchy, there are concepts that are broader and more extensible that subsume concepts beneath them. Let's take a concrete example. So let me state a fact. If you are doing serious hiking in a mountainous area, you need a topographical map. Well, let's talk about hierarchy. This is, in fact, one kind of map. So what's a map? A map is a diagrammatic representation of a physical location. That's the concept of a map. A map is a diagrammatic representation of a physical location. Under this, there are two general categories of maps, reference maps and thematic maps. A topographical map is a type of reference map, as are physical maps, road maps, zip code maps, time zone maps, etc. I think you're sensing the hierarchy of bigger ideas that subsume more specific ones. 
Inquiring minds usually want to know more than hierarchy. Perhaps you're asking, why do I need a topographical map if I already have a road map of an area where I intend to hike? This is really asking a cause-effect question. Road maps help you get to the area where you will hike. Topographical maps tell you about the terrain and help you plan your hike with the terrain in mind. Road maps seldom point out rough terrain with steep inclines because roads are engineered to navigate such challenges. Hikers need to know, however, not just distance as the crow flies and direction of the hike. They need to reckon with altitude and changes in elevation, as well as geographical features like cliffs and rivers that will challenge them physically and possibly eliminate the possibility of certain kinds of hikes. As we consider this sea of connectivity, notice how many additional concepts are necessitated by this brief consideration of topographical maps. There are reasons cartographers have created this specialized kind of map. And if you're a serious hiker, you need to know how to read these maps to plan your hikes. The recognition of additional conceptual Connections beyond the basics is, in fact, part of another C, which is creativity. Steve Jobs famously said, creativity is just connecting things. That's a bit pedestrian to those who declare themselves to be creatives, as though they were some sort of ubermensch. All humans have the potential to be creative. Creativity is not just the special province of the arts, either. Albert St. Giorgi, 1936 Nobel Prize winner in medicine, said, Discovery consists in seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. Einstein's theory of relativity has been called an intuitive leap of immense proportions. Einstein was a creative. Creativity is multidimensional, but it definitely consists of ideation, or conceptualization, if you will, and connectivity. Creativity shows up in other aspects of cognition that we'll deal with in a minute. The next C is constrained capacity, or cognitive load, if you will. Working memory with a transactional limit of only three to five elements at a time appears to have a chokehold on creativity. I've argued earlier this season that this choke point is meant to force us to cooperate with the way the brain is designed, to recognize patterns, in other words, and not to database facts. Pattern recognition within concept networks forces us to produce models, or schemata, that organize many concepts under a single label. Examples of schemata that you may be familiar with include cognitive behavioral therapy, supply-side economics, genetically modified organisms, quantum physics, and the list could go on and on. Schema formation is part of chunking, which is the next C. Constrained capacity pushes us to create chunks. A chunk counts as a single item in working memory. Well, this frees up space in working memory to allow us to create new concepts and new connections with our existing concepts, models, and schemata. It also allows us space to regularly revisit big ideas in our schemata with a view to improving them by both addition and subtraction. The ability to retrieve ideas is not merely for the purpose of rehearsing settled truth. 
Repeated retrieval either reinforces an idea in memory or causes it to be revised by bringing it into contact with competing ideas or exemplars. The brain is ruthless in its pruning. Occam's razor says the simplest explanation is most likely to be the correct one. The brain's design agrees because the brain is always simplifying in a quest for the gist. What is the core idea that we are to act on? And this will not be an unexamined fact that we memorized. Remember that the primary purpose of long-term memory is not to warehouse snapshots from the past. Memory is where we fashion a conceptual framework that we use in intelligent decision-making. How will we tackle the problems that we face? What do we really believe is true? Our conceptual framework should be populated mostly with ideas that have been reinforced over time as we retrieve them and use them. This is why it's so important not to become sclerotic and to refuse to test what we believe. Truth survives testing. Truth proves its utility over and over again. The brain blows out the chaff of our experience every night in a process called consolidation, which is another of the seven C's. Consolidation can happen while we're awake, but it's most commonly allocated to our sleep cycle, and in particular happens during deep sleep, as well as in some regards during our dreams. This makes it essential that we regularly get a good night of sleep. To skimp on sleep is to hobble our learning. Consolidation brings out the old, the things from long-term memory that we have learned previously that have been retained, and puts the old in contact with new inputs from the day to see what will survive. Remember, learning is conceptual change. New concepts, new ideas, if you will, compete with old ideas to see which will survive the crucible of testing. Old ideas can, with some difficulty, be erased. New ideas frequently don't survive the first night of sleep and therefore never become part of long-term memory. Old and new ideas, which appear in the brain to conflict, may represent different ways of representing the same central idea. If so, the brain strives to merge them into a coherent whole by trimming and by creation and clarification of connections. Contradictions between ideas may be only superficial and not real. The concepts involved, when properly clarified, may in fact represent different ideas that coexist nicely. Forgetting, therefore, is an intended result of consolidation. It is a feature, not a bug. Learning what to forget so that truth is brought into sharper focus is an essential element of the big C of creativity, which is one of the seven C's of cognition. Michelangelo said something parallel to this idea of forgetting. He said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. The genius, in other words, the creativity is in knowing what to remove and what to retain. The more you put into your working memory, the more you have to work with to refine your concepts and schemata to their most truthful and powerful form. 
Well, this is really an argument for broadly experiencing the world around you. Analogies are a powerful cognitive tool, but you're less likely to formulate them when your experience is impoverished. The concepts and models that have been developed by great thinkers over the centuries should be your diet. Malnourishment results from eating only what you already agree with. Louis Pasteur pointed out this danger when he said, quote, The greatest derangement of the mind is to believe in something because one wishes it to be so. End quote. To sum up this podcast, which is the summary of this season, deep and durable learning is the result of one, an intense curiosity about the world around you. You need to become an omnivore who explores ideas wherever you find them. Number two, deep and durable learning occurs through the purposeful pursuit of patterns from your experience and the encoding of those patterns into concepts. Number three, deep and durable learning is the result of handling the facts that we're so commonly presented with by uh, a skepticism that does not accept facts at face value. Since you're, we're often given factual information as a given that we should just file away, instead learn to dissect facts into their component concepts. So you're still playing to your strengths as a, a pattern maker and a pattern detector. Deep and durable learning is the result, number four, of intentional reasoning that works to find a logical home for new concepts within your existing conceptual networks. And finally, number five, adequate sleep is an investment in optimizing your deep and durable learning through the revising of your concepts and conceptual frameworks through the process of consolidation, which works powerfully during deep sleep and REM sleep. Well, that's five items and the limit of working memory. Seriously, additional resources can be found in the accompanying blog post at deepanddurable.com. I would love to hear your reactions to the ideas we've developed this season. Let me know what was helpful and what you want clarified or need to know more about. Let me know what you hoped I would talk about but haven't so far. You can do that by going to contact me at my website, deepanddurable.com. That's deepanddurable.com. With summer vacation soon upon us, I will be taking a break to lead the Summer Institute in Teaching Science. I plan to resume podcasts on August 6th. See you then. <music>